introduction. It was so thorough. I almost feel like I don't need to introduce myself again, but so thank you both. Um, and thank you everyone who is here. I know um, we had a little bit of a weather hiccup, so thankfully this is virtual and you can all attend um, from the comforts of your own home. So yes, as Julia mentioned, my title is a vocational rehabilitation counselor. So what the heck does that mean, right? Vocational rehabilitation, for those that don't know, is a field of helping individuals that have any type of disability as defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act, any type of limitation that prevents the individual from either obtaining, advancing, um, or maintaining employment, right? We work with individuals, our, our program, our state agency, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, um, works with individuals 14 years old and on up through um, any age that folks wanna work. So um, we're gonna get into all the nitty gritty details and there will be plenty of time for you to ask your burning questions at the end. Um, but that is in a nutshell what VR is all about. Um, and so we're helping individuals. Sometimes they're coming to us having employment and it's about what they need to keep the job and other times um, it's advancing. Other times it's maybe an individual, a high school student, right? That for whom it's their first job ever. So with that, let's get into it. So we're going to understand um, how one might make a referral to DVR, whether that be a teacher or um, a parent, anyone, right? Who can make a referral? Anyone. Um, the application process, we're going to talk about eligibility. So we can't simply sign up for DVR, right? If we want, like some other programs, you sign up and then you start getting the services right away. I always try to explain that to folks that there is a little bit of a, a process, but I always go through step-by-step step so people know what to expect. Um, and we'll talk about that those steps today. Transition services, that's why we're all here, right? So we work with transition-aged youth, um, 14 years old through you know, 22 and beyond, as I mentioned, but today we're going to focus on that transition age and the services applicable for them. We're going to talk about best practices and share tools. So that's where I hope that you all um, ask good questions and we have some engaging conversation about how we can best serve youth. Um, and then I will, like I said, answer your questions. Um, okay. So as I mentioned, the Division of Oak Rehab as a state agency, we're part of the DWD. So you might have heard of the folks that, um, you know, verify unemployment or um, the labor statistics for the unemployment rates that come out, um, you know, within the DWD. And we're a small little part. Um, we're one of the divisions within that. Um, we have most of our uh, funding coming from the federal government, as you can see the numbers here. Hopefully this isn't in the way. Um, let me just see if I can. There we go. Um, and then 21.3% state match. All right. Um, and I already mentioned our mission. So very important to us that we, with everything that we do, that we think about our mission. So when should um, an individual be referred for our services? Well, anytime is better than not at all, right? Um, but ideally, I like to have high school students referred to me at least two years before they exit. So if they're in a transition program um, and they weren't referred in high school, that's okay. But ideally, um, a high school student that's 15, 16, um, I, I tend, this is also a counselor thing, um, counselor judgment um, topic. I tend to like when students are referred to me a little bit sooner so that I can really work with them, especially a student that maybe is considering attendance at a technical college, um, apprenticeship, something like that for a career goal. We just need time, right? Because it's the now job and then it's the what's next. Um, there is really no wrong time. Please don't invite me to the IEP the day before they graduate. Not much time there. Um, for those under 18, um, we don't need guardianship paperwork because if they're under 18, someone else is their guardian. We just need to know who, right? It's not always mom or dad. Um, and then if they're over 18 and they're not their own guardian, um, we do need that a copy of that guardianship paperwork. And, you know, we don't try to create extra barriers. So it's one of those like, Yes, absolutely. Let's get engaged. Let's get you signed up. But hey, we here's a list of the things, the paperwork, right, that we're going to need because we unfortunately need a lot of paperwork. 
Um, so we are going to need a copy of that, but it's not like if they can't find it that we're telling them that they can't apply. Um, and I don't think this presentation talks about it, so I'll speak to it now too. Um, we cannot require the social security number be provided. However, it is encouraged because it's very challenging to pay for certain things. We can't pay for advances, upfront monies, um, direct uh, reimbursements, things like that without it. So it's something that they really want us to try to verify also because we have services related to the social security benefits that could help a person. Um, but we don't turn anyone away if they don't have the paperwork, right? Um, and some of you might have specific questions about you know, legal right to work type of paperwork, and we can get to those later. Um, and then we can um, receive referrals a number of ways, right? So I'm going to show you at the end how to access on our website, the referral online, which is the quickest way, right? So that it comes to me as soon as possible. Um, but we can receive referrals, of course, right? By ma mail, we have had individuals tell us that they wanna come into the office um, and work with us to get that referral done to make sure they understand some of the questions can be confusing. So we can always do that over the phone or schedule a time for them to come into my office housed out of Beaver Dam to get that taken care of. So how do we make a person eligible, right? Well, we have to verify that they have a disability under the ADA. So school, right? falls under, high schools fall under a different law. They fall under the IDEA and we fall under the ADA. And so I don't expect anyone to be experts on the ADA, right? But um, it is up to a licensed vocational counselor to discern from what information we're given from a teacher, from a parent, if it's, um, if it meets our qualifying standards. It's really not that uh, much of a challenge, it's it's any disability, right? And so there have been a few like emotional behavioral disability type, um, those that are, there's usually something underlying, but in 99% of cases, it's going to be right within that IEP or even like a my chart list, um, if we get a release or otherwise guardian can send straight to us um, or drop off if they don't feel comfortable sending that electronically, of course. Um, but we don't require extensive documentation just to make someone eligible. For planning, right, that might be helpful, but for um, the initial steps, we just need something that states what the disability is. And I also want to say um, that, you know, you can read this here. I also want to say that a counselor can observe a disability. So sometimes what happens is an individual applies on the basis of one diagnosed um, diagnosed condition. And then when we're meeting with um, him or her or them, it is apparent that they maybe also have a hearing impairment or they have something else. And so we want to be asking questions, right, as we're working with the person, what else is maybe going on. Um, but if it's an observed condition that is um, a visible disability, right, then we can, um, we can use counselor observation as well. I think I covered this, but just in case, um, so we will work with the applicant to um, try to find that documentation. So like I said before, we pay for, we, we can have a release signed by the applicant and we pay for records. So if a person has absolutely no records, they are working with us and they didn't somehow didn't have special education services or whatever, um, we can do an evaluation if need be, we can pay for the medical records, et cetera. Um, we can, this says we can refer for an additional assessment. So just know, please don't not refer a student um, or a youth if you think they would benefit. If like, let's say that you think they have a mental health um, challenge, they have a psychiatric disability perhaps, but you can't really at, feel comfortable asking them or you don't wanna ask them and you don't know, um, then certainly still refer them if they're interested and you have that conversation and then we can um, try to get some diagnostics. So when we're looking at um, a person's eligibility, so I said before, we're mostly federally funded, right? So there's a law, there are lots of laws that govern how we do what we do in our policies. And the federal government um, way back in the 70s decided that um, we needed to serve individuals with the most significant limitations first. Makes sense, right? Like if you have the greater need, you should get the help first. And so that is still the law. Um, DV, the Division of Oak Rehab in Wisconsin has not had a wait list, knock on wood, um, since 2015. But when we do, when we're at capacity and we do have very high um, caseload sizes, we do have to implement the wait list. And when we have a wait list, 
Um, we have to put people into categories, which I hate to say, but it, it's just to make sure that the people that have the biggest barriers get served first, okay? And so this order of selection is referring to that. We're gonna go over that in more depth, but when we're looking at eligibility and we're talking with an individual, either by phone or in person in those initial phases, usually, you know, if it's a student with certainly with their guardian or some adults, and then the guardian signs off if the guardian's at work, right? We're looking at these areas. So um, we're going to be asking them. It's a fairly structured phone call, although people tend to share things and we just need to know which box is. But a licensed counselor does have to ultimately approve um, the categorization that we're going to get to in the next slide. Um, so just know that like, even if it's another DVR staff that's trained to do this or another agency we've trained now for, I think, seven years to do these, we have to be licensed in order to make that final yes, they're eligible, they have the documentation and they have a limitation. They have to have a limitation in just one of these seven areas. Okay, so um, if they have a limit, if they have more than four or more limitations, then they're going to be in a different category. Um, so let's get into the categories. Okay, this that didn't say. Um, I'm just going to talk about them. So mobility, communication, we look at self-care, self-direction, um, how folks get along with people or interpersonal skills. And also that fits into um, like self-advocacy in the workplace. How much work can you tolerate, um, both physically and mentally, and then work skills. And so, like I said before, if an individual has more limitations in more of these areas, um, they're going to be, you know, category one versus two. And so when they get the letter, I always try to explain to people because what, what category one, and it's a form filled letter, right? But we can say, this is what this means, right? And so we, there's no wait list right now for category one or two. Um, it's very, very rare that we have someone coming to us with a diagnosed disability that doesn't have a limitation to their employment in one of these areas. When that happens, we consult. Um, okay. So what does transition look like? So there are a bunch of images um, for folks that maybe have a visual impairment. There's a child with a coming off of a school bus. There's a teacher. Um, there's a, a young woman learning. It looks like some trades, right? So it looks like a lot of things. It looks like learning. It looks like learning about careers. Um, it looks like skill building. Um, so some key practices, and I think many on this probably this call probably know these things and can speak to this. Um, it's really helpful for DVR to accept appropriate referrals and to engage with as many youth across the state as we possibly can when we're invited to IEPs or something like this, or when we're invited to come speak at a school or talk to teachers, all of it. Um, and so this really helps us um, reach more students. We can offer employment planning consultation. Um, so any student with a disability, whether they have a case or not, can receive assistance from any DVR staff. It doesn't need to be a counselor. Um, some of our areas we're sending staff that have been trained because we we have a lot of people that we work with, right, as counselors. Um, and I know, and I work closely with Julia, I know that I have several that aren't like active consumers, but we're still providing some services. And so if there are questions about what we can provide, which services we can provide without an active, like I call it DVR light, right? We can get into that at the end, but there is just know there are options and there is like a separate type of case for students that maybe just want a few services and then maybe um, test the waters and then try um, full-blown DVR later on. So, and like I said, best practices to just show up at the high schools, having a presence at the schools is really important. Um, we covered this. So attending parent-teacher conferences. So having a booth, um, I have done that. I have had tables. I am attending a um, job fair at a high school soon, and I'll be modeling how to talk with employers with, a, with certain students that feel comfortable and have signed up for that. So those are just some of the things, ways that I engage with schools and that other counselors across the state might be or and DVR staff might be engaging with with schools. Okay, helpful tools. Um, so coordinated transition services with schools and other partner agencies. So this is like what we do, right? This is what this we're getting into the meat of what DVR does. So job exploration counseling, talking about interest. And those first few meetings after students been determined eligible, 
you know, I've done the intake for the students. Um, it's the counselor typically most areas that does, does all of that eligibility process I just described. So after I've done the intake, I'm going to say, okay, you're eligible. Let's set up a time to meet. You'll get the letter for eligibility. Let's set up a time to meet. And then those first few meetings, two, one to three, usually two for students covers, you know, I'm not asking them to tell me their whole plan. <laughs> You know, what are you going to be when you're 35 and you have to know how you're going to get there? That's my job to help them understand how to get there, right? So job exploration, like just talking about interests, talking about what are their skills now? Um, what are they doing through their transition programs or their high schools? Are they, you know, passing out, um, taking, you know, taking coffee orders and passing out copies to the teachers? Like what are, what are their skills? What do they like to do? And what do you not want to do, right? Like what, what maybe should be avoid? Um, a lot of high school students come to me and the only job they can tell me they know is working in fast food. Well, we all know fast food is very fast paced. It certainly wouldn't be a fit for me. I think that fast food is a good fit for some people, but there are lots of other jobs out there, right? And so it's our job to teach the youth, like, what are the other types of work settings? And so one of the ways um, that we that we talk, you know, we're doing this counseling, I'm doing this counseling with them. But one of the ways that we really uh, have a hands on method for teaching youth how to explore is through something called job shadows. So a job shadow is where the individual um, has a actual tour set up at a business. And I might ask the, the individual student beforehand Let's make a list together of the places that interest you, or if not the places, the jobs, right? If maybe they need help with identifying places, depending on skill level and you know Google Maps ability, um, what do you wanna do? What are the tasks that you've done before or that you think you could do that your teachers are telling you, your parents are telling you you're good at? And then we set up an actual tour and they get to go explore that job and as many as they want. Typically it's three to four. Some uh, students just want to get working. So they do one or two and say, do I have to do these, Jesse, or can I just start a job? Okay, right. Um, and that brings me to work-based learning. So once we've identified, we've explored and we've identified, you know, this is a work setting that is maybe going to be a fit. It's a good start. It's um, going to maybe be a place where the student can build confidence in themselves and those initial skills, then um, we would set up work-based learning. So a, that's a job, right? A student job. Um, so we can either be the funding source for that. If there isn't a position, let's say it's part of a job and you know the student needs to be able to do all of these five tasks. And right now with their ability, they're able to do three of those tasks. We approach the business and we say, would you would you have someone to be able to help mentor and act as a site supervisor for the student, knowing that there's going to be supports from our agency and we could potentially fund um, that paid internship or it might be a job. So we might actually be looking at a posted position, depending on the a lot of things, right? The student, so many factors. But that's what we do at that level, um, at that step. And then we're talking about for some folks post secondary. So after high school. Um, educational programs and what those could look like. So we're not telling students, you all have to apply for college, right? That's That doesn't make sense. These are individualized. Um, and I also always try to include the family, right? Because if we're not, if family's not on the same page, right? Mom and dad are pushing, going to technical college, but student doesn't want to go, like, we got to talk about that, right? Um, because no one's going to handhold you once you're going to college. So work-based readiness training, that would be, those are um, actually things I'm working on with Julia right now and have been for several years. Um, those are usually soft skill classes, uh, the soft skills specific to the workforce, right? And so um, we have agents, partnering agencies that put those on in, with in, in a partnership and DBR is the funding source. And I work together with teachers like Julia to make those um those courses happen and usually they are during the school day um, just so students have access to things like money smart you know like learning there's a series of curriculum that's approved learning how to budget and it's all work related how to count money um, those are examples of that work-based readiness we have lots of programs we have self-advocacy as this mentioned so lots of things but those are that's a, like a, a snapshot of some of the transition services we have so many more we can get to um, so DVR employment planning and consultation services, what are they? 
Okay, so how do we determine, like I said before, what are the services that that individual is going to need? Well, that's, that's really what describes in a nutshell my role, right? So I'm not gonna tell the student, but it's my job to know our services really well and to get to know that student and their family or whoever their supports are, whomever is on their team and together identify what they're going to need from us. And so within these first few meetings, that's what we're working on. We're working on something <laughs> This will be confusing for everybody in the transition world. So and it's an acronym, but we work on something called an IPE, not to be confused with IEP. So we work, um, we work on this plan. It's a written document and the student's not expected to do it. It's not a homework assignment. No one's needing to go typing anything, but I am going to involve that student, right? It's very important to involve them because what is a plan for them in their future if it if it doesn't involve them? And so it's much shorter than an IEP. Um, my plans are anywhere from five to student plans, five to seven pages. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, this is these are your rights and these are the responsibilities. And then we talk about but the services, right? The things that DVR is going to do, and very importantly, the goals that I I have set with the student. So very small um, smart goals, right? that they're going to move forward and we call them progress measures that they're going to be able to do. And then we set those together, right? Because I, again, I'm not gonna set a goal with a student um, if they don't know what their goal is and they're not involved in it. And so sometimes it's like, you know, we get this plan done that we have to do and it's electronic and they get a copy, but then it's okay, but what are your goals? What do you, out of all of this, like, do you know what goals you've set in your plan? And what is your employment goal? What is it now? Do we wanna focus on the now job or, what if you really know what your career goal is, let's talk about how we're, you and I are going to meet and research that together over the years, right, so that you can get there. So that's what it, that document is. And that's what we're working towards when we have our first, um, like I said, several appointments. It's different for everyone. There's no set number. We need to have at least one meeting to get that done, right? Not going to write a plan without someone. And then DVR helps consumers. Um, yeah, the plan is to get a, find a job, get a job or get a better job. And so sometimes it is a student that's worked with me before and they have a job, but they wanna just explore and focus on that career piece or they want a, you know more hours at their job, they wanna raise, et cetera, all of those things. Yeah. I love this quote. So DVR is about planning, right? So Yogi Bear said, if you don't know where you are going, you'll end up someplace else. So it, it can be hard. It can be really hard to talk to students that are so focused on next week or even what they're going to have for dinner when they're going to see their friends. It can be hard to talk about that long-term planning and starting from the end and work, working backwards, right, is how we set and achieve goals. And so sometimes it's just shorter term goals built on top of shorter term goals with that end and the and helping them to understand their why and that helps sometimes with um feeling more comfortable and practicing talking about the end the end goals um the bigger goals the scary goals right and and just like empathizing with the fact that they might not know what they want to do yet and that's okay i think there's so much pressure on youth right now to know what they want to do and that's certainly not what we want we want to help foster the sense of exploration and curiosity about working, right? Um, okay, comparable benefits. So we have money, right? Newsflash. So we are a state agency funded by, thank you all, it's taxpayer dollars. And so we have funds to pay for things, um, which is beautiful, beautiful. And it's something I love about my job because I can actually say, yes, I can pay for your steel toe boots or yes, I can pay for your, do you know what you're supposed to wear to your interview? And I can pay for your clothes, right? Because you haven't gotten a paycheck. Um, but there's a caveat, right? Like we do need to explore other funding sources. So DVR helps with transportation. And this is like one of the most uh, the hot topics and questions that I get most frequently is, can we pay for transportation as an example? And I say, yes, and we need to explore how your student, your son or daughter, et cetera, the student is gonna get to and from that job for the long-term because DVR is a transition sort of a program, right? Like we, we are intended to bridge the gap between 
school and what's next, but we don't just have people forever that were that are on our caseloads, right? We need to be able to help the next person, the next person. And so um, we want to empower people to not need us anymore, even students. And so it's not a rush. Um, but you know, we want to that we want to give someone the tools, right? Um, teach them how to fish, right? And so we want to make sure that there are other means that they're going to be getting to work, whether we're helping them with like teaching them that student like through the driver's ed, um, how to drive, or if that's not an option, like maybe there's public transportation or in the case of Columbus area, um, you know, taxi even is hard sometimes, but we just have to be creative. Um, I've worked in a rural area now for several years and it is always, transportation is always a big piece, but when we put our heads together and work as a team, um, we can we can solve those puzzles, right? So that's one I bring up, even though it's not on here, um, because it probably comes up the most is like we, we can't pay for transportation forever, but we can in the short term pay for it. Um, and we want to be exploring which other agencies. So like is a person working with children's long term supports is a great example Is a person working with you know, some other, especially the adults I serve, they're working with WorkSmart and all these other agencies and they have funding too, right? Um, sometimes there's a special needs trust that's rare, but that maybe would fund things. So, but we, we will pay for things. We just, it, how are you going to not need us someday, right? And that's also part of teaching that adult skill. Um, yeah, and financial aid is a great example too. So going back to technical college for those for whom it may be applicable, we do have to um, require, we do require folks to apply for financial aid first before we could, so that we know how much grant money we could, we could provide for that. So our end goal is integrated employment. So we are not by law able to serve a student that wants to go work um, in a sheltered workshop, which there are still some of those that have those special 14C licenses, um, even within our counties. Um, they're not bad places, right? There are a lot of good things that come of them, but they're not integrated, right? So what does that mean? That means that um, every single person there, now they're making minimum wage at many of these places, which is great. That's a that's a win. But many of these places are not, um, they're all, they're, they all have disabilities and they're all working together with folks that also have disabilities um, instead of being out in the community setting where we're also educating the community then, right? And making sure we have a diverse workforce. Um, so the most integrated setting is now defined as a setting that enables an individual to interact with persons without developmental disabilities to the fullest extent possible. And you could extend that to any other disability, right? So, and if people have questions and this has come up, you know, well, what if my son or daughter wants to go to this? Like, I'm happy to entertain them. It's not like a dirty question to ask or a dirty word, right? Like we can talk about it, but um, we just, we can't be supporting volunteer work um, with our funding and we can't be supporting something that's not integrated with our funding. So successful closure. So I already said this, but we want we, empowerment, right? We want you to not need us anymore. Um, so once an individual has maintained employment for a minimum of 90 days, we will close the file. However, however, that already sounds very ominous, right? We will close the file at 90 days. Well, we need to be having conversations, and I do have conversations about job stability. Is the person anywhere near graduating, or do they need support with that transition? Are they like in their forever job? Because sometimes, sometimes that does happen where they feel like this is their forever job because they started working with them at a young age. Um, and th there are rare situations, but especially with the folks that are on this today, like the, the transition programs um, in your areas, it's very rare. Like usually I'm going to be um, well past 90 days because it's like a first job and then a stepping stone next job. And then a, so the minimum of 90 days is more for an individual that like we're looking for the the job that they want to have forever, right? Or they think they want to have for the next five years and then they get it, they're stable. Like that, that is really, that cookie cutter really doesn't fit for a lot of students. Sometimes it does, um, but we can't close a case without making sure that the consumer, that there's a guardian, the guardian, everyone's on board and we need to be having progress meetings, um, ideally monthly, but at least depending on the situation, at least every two months, we need to be having progress meetings. How's that job going? So we know, right? Because if there's an issue, um, then it needs to be addressed. And then maybe we need to extend that follow along period that we call job retention. So 
Um, and then supported or customized employment. That's a whole other, those are very complex. We can talk if people have questions, but just know that the 90 days is going to be longer for those individuals. And like I said before, it's, it's often longer anyway for students. Um, but we do have to close people. So we actually, so if we don't have successful employment outcomes, right, we don't, if we can't show that we have helped an individual achieve a successful employment outcome, then what happens to our funding, right? And then we don't have people to help the next. So that's why we're not trying to, you know, kick people. I certainly don't try to kick people off. If they still need us, they still need us, but we do have to close people. Um, otherwise we couldn't help people. So Okay, um, and then some resources. So I think um, this presentation can be shared. I can make sure it's shared with you all. Um, but we do have a special statewide team. Um, Jennifer Spring is the counselor in my area that our whole region that's on it. And she's fantastic. Um, and she's the liaison for this. Uh, but I also know quite a bit about transition too. So you can always just ask me, but there is a list that's public public information and here are the links and we can make sure that this gets sent out so that the links are live. And then this liaison list, ideally this liaison list should be updated. Um, so in real time, you should be able to go to see like if you have, if you're like, oh, my brother, you know, my nephew or whatever is in this other county and maybe they could really benefit, like, please, we, we don't want to be the best kept secret, like, please share the information and um, you can always find out who the, the counselor covering those schools or that area would be by going to this public list. So, and I think that's all I have as far as the presentation itself. Um, do we think, Tim, that I want to talk a little bit about job developer connections, or do we want to give some questions and then talk about that? Um, let's go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, so you can please put your questions in the chat, or you all are also free to unmute. We are a cozy society tonight, and so I'm going to trust that you will not step over um, everybody's answer. So please just feel free to unmute. We will see that you have unmuted and ask your questions. Um, I will also be monitoring the chat. If you would prefer that I read your question, um, then feel free to put it in the chat. We do have a thank you for you for the information, Jesse. That was, um, I, I enjoyed that. And I've heard DVR presentations before. This one gave me some information that, that some of the others didn't. And I know it's supposed to be a, a stock presentation from DVR, but you done good. So I appreciate that. Um, questions? I have a question. I have a couple of questions. I was taking notes throughout the whole thing. So <laughs> um, what are the assessments like when you provide those? How does that work? Great question. So, and this sort of speaks to the, the job developer um, frequently asked question that we'll get to. I don't have the qualifications, right? I'm not a licensed psychologist. In fact, my qualifications I did post in the chat and so I don't have a license to diagnose anyone. So when we do an assessment like a psychological assessment or even um, an actual vocational assessment where certain test batteries are administered, like certain interest profilers, certain abilities profilers, those have to be administered by the person that holds that credential, right? And so the way that DVR would handle those situations, and I'll, I'll speak to all assessments in a sec, but is we would contract with those. And we have certain providers that are vetted that, you know, they pass our background checks, they follow our rules, they have to submit reports to us. And so we would pay those individuals. And it's not just, okay, you're getting this person. Like it's a conversation, right? With the parents, the guardians, the student, um, like here are the provider options. Do you know of them? Do you have any, you know, do you want to contact them and look at their website or do you want me to just make my professional recommendation because I work with these people, right? And so um, we would pay for those types of assessments um, and have the professional doing those services. Now, we are assessing consumers, right? Like part of my job as a vocational counselor is to assess and, and specific to disability is to assess when I'm meeting with them, what are their limitations? Um, you know, what are the transportation, what are their preferences? What are the things, priorities, things that we have to con uh, be concerned with when we're writing their plan? Um, what are their barriers? So I think we are doing those assessments. We are, I'm going to look at labor market information with the person. Um, you know, here are some resources that I like to use and they're different 
typically than what the school uses. Like I take people to the ONET, which is an amazing resource. Um, there are others that are national databases that can help folks understand the labor market. Um, and so that's part of assessment too, because if they understand like what their abilities are and to compare it to what the jobs are requiring, right, that's helpful. Um, so there are all kinds of, you know, we can fund an audiology, again, not a licensed audiologist. Um, I'm trying to think what other sorts of assessment. We typically don't do just a general, like if someone needs, um, they haven't had their physical exam. But that being said, if they need their doctor to just give restrictions and they haven't seen a physician and they know they're, you know, they're going to establish care or something. We do have a form that we've made up and I have one that I like to use that's like just pretty basic that a primary care physician could accept um, that would give us a medical assessment in a way, right? We just don't typically fund that. But those are some of the examples of assessments that this, like I said, the psychological assessment, the vocational um, evaluation and the audiology are the top three that we're doing pretty regularly. Um, and then, of course, assessment, like having the conversation, talking about the vocational barriers, interests, et cetera. Did that fully answer it? Yep. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Michelle, you had said you had a couple of questions. Did you have another one after that? I was going to let someone else go, but um, yeah, there was one other thing. Um, what was it? I was taking notes. Oh, someone told me to start my children on this program at 14. Is that like a little bit, like, that's not accurate, correct? Because I was kind of, you know, taken aback by that. You know, I really don't like... <laughs> giving an age to it. I mean, we, we can't take them before 14. So there's that, like right. we do look at the birthday, they need to be at least 14 years old. Um, it really is situational, right? We work with individuals. And so I like to, I know it's not, it's not an easy answer, but there's, we call it DVR gray. Um, but you know, it really depends if your son or daughter, et cetera, the student is not ready to start hands-on work yet and maybe would be not ready even to go explore through a job shadow, then maybe they're too young. If they are really motivated to start having their own money, you know, um, they, they're, you know, able to be out and about with people. I mean, not that we don't accommodate for like things like anxiety, of course we do, but just like if they have the, if they've had the experiences, the life experiences up through that point that at 14, they're like raring to go, let's go explore and let's, have my first job, then yeah, sign them up. I mean, we do need to think about a work permit before they're uh, 16. That's the law in Wisconsin, but we pay for those as well. And I can help with resources. You know, you can get it at the school, but we don't just say throw up, you know, we help with that. Um, but it really just depends. Like if, if you're just being told to sign up because it's the soonest you can, but then your student doesn't really want to engage yet or isn't ready yet, then we're not going to get anywhere because that's just too soon. So it really, I know that's hard, but if you have questions, you can always just reach out and I can talk through those situations with someone too. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So the, the the standing question that I always have for DVR is is sort of based on my experience when my son um, went into DVR uh, for counseling and we did. Um, he then had to go someplace else and got these assessments, which was great. We had these interest profiles and they did a wonderful job and they, they had him starting in an impossible direction that I hadn't even thought about. So that was really cool. It got us thinking about some different things. Um, and, and, and so he had a job counselor at, at, he had a counselor at DVR. Um, but then he's like, okay, we're going to have you work with an employment agency now. And I've talked to other parents. It's just like, okay, does that mean I'm no longer with DVR? I'm now with an employment agency. How did those communicate? And who do I call when I have questions? So could you just talk a little bit about that relationship that DVR has with the employment agencies that they work with? Absolutely, Tim. Thanks for bringing this up. Thanks. And I would say on my end, it comes up a lot too. I think it's really our duty um, as DVR staff to explain this thoroughly. Um, you know, we're not, people that have 
disabilities have so many different hoops to jump through. They have, in many cases, so many different caseworkers, this program, that person, this person, you know, and it's overwhelming for everyone. It's overwhelming for the family. It's overwhelming for, you know, the student. It's it's a lot. And so I always want to build that rapport early and set the stage explaining that, you know, I, I try to liken it to like, I'm like your IEP case manager, right? Your IEP case manager isn't going to teach you all the classes. I mean, maybe at the transition program, but in high school, they're not going to teach you math, science, you know, they're going to be the person that you go to, to advocate, to make sure that all your teachers are following your IEP, um, that you get your needs met, that you're talking about having those conversations about transition. And so I try to explain that to students in particular, that that is similarly my role in the DVR side of things. I'm not going anywhere. I tell them you're stuck with me, right? Um, but it's explaining that I am not going to provide each specific service. I'd love to go on job shadows. I've gone on some, I've set some up, right? I can do job development and talk to employers, but you know, we have really high caseloads and we want to make sure that the coordination is happening. And there's a lot of behind the scenes. There's a lot of behind the scenes with funding all of these things, right? Like we have to do purchase orders and we have to make sure, and we have multiple schools we're covering. And so the consumer would not benefit if I, I would love to go to all the job shadows, but there simply aren't enough of me, right? And they would not benefit. Services would take um, an astronomically long amount of time. And so I always explain that I'm like similar to your IEP case manager and that I'm at the center with you and your parent, your team, right? Like we're at the center here and we get to pick people to be part of our team for, for a hot minute, right? Like for part of this, um, but they might not be part of it for all of it. And so I'm one to get a lot of release forms signed for people um, so that they understand what type of information is being shared with each agency, because it's not all the information for each agency. And then there's a, a finite like, OK, so then when that service is done, we're no longer they're not going to necessarily be part of it anymore. Right. So I think having that conversation early um, and just making sure to hit home again and again and again, I like to reinforce. So. You're not going to get in trouble or kicked out of DVR if you forget to contact me every three and a half weeks, but we do have monthly contact requirements. It's written right in the plans and I go over it and I will reach out to you. How should I reach out to you? Do you, you know, I, I don't have a physical phone. So with text, I have to know their carrier and then I can send an email, but you know, text, email, call. I think it's a really important skill for youth to learn how to send a professional email. So if they're struggling with that, hey, let's work through that. Or is there someone else, you know, that can work through that more in depth with you if it's going to be um, extensive, but like being able to make phone calls and send emails and with assistance is really important for employment. And so um, it's important that they contact me and provide updates and I will be reaching out to them. And so having that, going back to what you're saying, like if there are there are our DVR staff that haven't done this well, right? I'm just gonna say. And so I think that's where a lot of the disconnect happens. And it happens sometimes with me too, but it is our job to kind of remind everyone, like, so I'm here to be your advocate with you. Like I'm here to coordinate all your services. And if there are things that aren't going well, like that's why we take the time at the beginning to establish trust so that you tell me, hey, I actually don't like this job. Can we find something different? Or like, I need help here, but I've been afraid to speak up or like that is my role. And so just explaining my role, um, sometimes maybe over explaining, but for folks, but like, it's really important. And um, so, yeah, that does happen. But I think just explaining, like, this is going to be your job person. I'm your counselor. I'm not going anywhere. I'm like your case. I'm, I am their case coordinator. Right. Um, and I'm not going anywhere. And we need to still be communicating. And oftentimes I'm the one doing that initiating, initiating the communication, but not always like there are students that they got it and they're communicating with me. And that's great. And, and I have had to change providers too. Like, and so that's just it is if there's good rapport and there's a provider that a job development provider that's not working out, they can tell me and we can make a change. Um, because I have the power, right? So if they don't understand my role and they feel stuck, of course, they're going to have a negative experience with DVR. Um, if they're, they don't know who, you know, they don't remember. So it's, it's really important. And that's really the onus for that is on us, I think. Um, and could you explain just a little bit more about how the job development process works? Like, yeah, when, when do they great. stop with you and start mm -hmm. with them? And great question, Julia. So yes. Um, so 
typically, so that plan that we talked about, that IPE, right? I won't quiz anybody. The individualized plan for employment. Um, that written plan that we're talking about, uh, what what they want to do for maybe it's for the now if it's a student, maybe it's the end the career goal they think, but then the services and then those goals. That plan uh, has to be done before we start working with the job developer, right? So individuals come to us sometimes students, right? I need money. I want a summer job tomorrow. Well, <laughs> like, you know, that it takes time to get these services in place. We have to get your plan done and like set goals. And then we need to talk about job development providers, like the different agencies we work with and pick your, pick your job person, right? It's going to be part of our team again, not replacing DVR. And so that takes time. And so prefacing that, and then as far as the timing of it, that plan has to be done. So there are very few things we can do without that written plan done, which means someone does have to make a commitment to coming to meetings. You know, we don't require people to show up in person anymore. Those days are long gone, but we do want some buy-in, right? We want to see that the person or the family has shown up to meetings consistently. There's no set requirement, but just you're showing up, you want this, you're engaging. We're going to write the plan. Then financially we can make a referral, um, we can make a referral for job development. And so we do have to have that plan signed because the plan, um, the service listed in the plan is what gives us the financial power, right? So we can't pay for things without that plan. Exceptions. So we talked about assessment. Uh, we are able to provide assessments, fund assessments in order to help with the planning process before the plan is written. So um, job, working with a job developer to help find a job, though, is not an assessment. So that would be someone that really and truly does have no idea. You know, oftentimes it's someone that's done one job their entire life and then they're injured or something. Then we can do a vocational assessment where I mentioned before for, do, for um, documentation of disability, we can pay for an assessment prior to plan. But just if there are questions, just ask. Right. But typically um, most of the services that the students are wanting, like those um, even the job shadow, we could maybe, we, I have very rarely um, upon occasion done a job shadow if a student just has like no idea, but we really need to be having that um, discussion that like this is, you know, just for an assessment and then we need to get your plan done because that plan is um, at the hub of what we do and we it's our financial power. So we can't pay our lovely job coaches that do so much, you know, in the community to support the individuals that are working. Um, we can't pay those folks. Those folks don't get paid if we don't have that plan done. So we don't, we can't authorize for that funding, right? So you get that, that, you get that plan done, you start working with the job developer. What's the job developer going to be doing? Yeah, yep. So the job developer will, we can have a joint meeting. So sometimes people say, you know, I still want you there, Jesse. Like, I'm not sure I can advocate for myself or the family wants me there. And that's great. And so I always give that as an option. Um, if it's unnecessary, and certainly I don't want my to schedule to tie anyone up, um, then they start a meeting. So the job developer is going to start gathering, they're going to get referral information from me. So a form is going to be signed to allow information to be shared. And the job developer is going to start gathering that information. Um, they're going to read what I've sent them, right? Like, okay, so so-and-so is interested in this. And if I put it on the release form, I share case notes, right? At the very least, like what made them eligible, they need to know about some of those barriers and the interests there, the work experiences. And they they gather that information and they then they start helping the individual with further planning. So like, who are the businesses we're going to con? Like, okay, so this is your goal that you established with DVR. What are going to be some of the barriers like with transportation, et cetera? They're like kind of building on the convers initial conversations that we've had. And then um, they are helping the individual with practice with interviews, writing a resume. If it's a student that, you know, a resume for whom a resume is appropriate or a visual resume. Right. And then um, so doing all of that prep and like some practice interviews um, and then actually identifying like what are the businesses? So the job developers that we work with have connections in the community, right? Like they know different managers, they um, work with different human resources offices. And so they are going to then start connecting to businesses and, um, you know, hey, I have a, a student, you know, sometimes they're present at the interviews if they, it's really individualized as far as the level of support, I'd say, like not all students even really need a job coach, but most students benefit from having check-ins at the very least, if not like someone with them um, the first couple times. So that job developer is going to make sure if it's not the job developer with them and the job, teaching them the tasks of the job, 
um, you know, maybe the job developer helps them with hiring paperwork, then maybe the job developer's staff would be the one um, job coaching. We can ask for like consistency whenever possible. I will tell you that across the state, across the state, we do not have enough job coaches or job developers, right? Like we have a huge shortage. Um, so we, we try to make our asks very kindly, <laughs> but we, we can say, you know, this person, this consumer really needs uh, to work with a man or to work with a woman, or this person really needs, you know, to, to have phone call meetings only, or I don't know, um, you know, this, the same person, like that's hard, but it's doable. And I've done it before. I've advocated and said, you know, we can't have certainly people call in sick or whatever, but like, we can't have three different job coaches with this person. Like here's this person's behavioral needs. Like this is their situation. We need to put like the same person with them. And that's, even though I'm not their, the job developer's boss, right? Like I'm not their manager. That is, we're, we're paying them. So that is very much something that I would advocate for. But yeah, and then checking in with the business. So starting with, you know, I, I mentioned like the job preparation as far as what they do. And then with the business, checking in with um, the businesses to make sure that the job, uh, the, the employer needs are being met, right? The job is being done thoroughly on that side of it. And then is the consumer being um, served appropriately? Like are accommodations being met? Do, are, can, are they learning the tasks? Like, can they do the thing, right? And so, and we can, like I said, 90 days plus months and months and for students, it's much longer than 90 days, but um, hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. That's just, it's okay. a confusing part of the the system. So I appreciate that, that clarification of what's mm -hmm. going to happen when someone starts working with the job development agency. Thanks for the question. So that was great. Um, before we close out, any further questions for Jesse? And I do want to remind you that we do have a short, very, I promise, short evaluation in the chat that if you could click on your way out, that would be great. But any any last questions? Nothing unmuted. Um, Nancy, are you trying to unmute and ask a question? I just want to make sure before we, we disengage. Because we can't hear you. Yes, I was just looking for the chat so I could make sure that I would I could fill out the evaluation. And thank you very much, Jesse. That was great. And I appreciate you filling out evaluations, Nancy. Trust yeah. me. They always <laughs> say, okay, you. Kim, why don't you get enough evaluation? I'm like, I forget to tell people. That's why I don't <laughs> have an evaluation. So thank you for that. Sure. I'll be back. All okay. right. Well, Jesse, my wholehearted thanks to you as well. Thank you all for being here. We do have a few more Transition Talks Tuesdays uh, coming up. We have a job, an employment panel. Um, set up with employers from the Columbus area that we're all excited about. And then our final one will be in a few weeks and we'll talk special needs financial planning. That's the one that got canceled back in March. Then we'll move forward to April 16th. So just so you know, we do have a couple more left. So hopefully you'll be back for those. Thank you all. Have a great Thank night. You. Stop the recording and then I'll hang out for a little while more if anybody has any off tape questions.